I am supposed to speak about our next part. And uh, uh, this I wanted me to talk specifically on this topic, so I said okay. And um, I'll be focusing on the Arabian Nights and just a few paintings from that series, which was, I consider, his most important work. And it was done in just one year, 1913. Uh, but before we go there, I will speak a little bit about other things so that we understand what's the importance of this work and what is that I mean when I write reimagining the Arabian Nights. Now, his Abhinayat is normally remembered as the artist who revived Indian art and who brought in kind of modernism with a local flavor to uh, this part of the world. Now, what were the challenges he was facing and what was the main <coughs> challenge that he undertook as an artist? To understand that, we probably have to look a little before Indian art, a little before the colonial period. And I'm going to show you just two or three examples and not really uh, talk about this period in any great detail. But just to indicate some of the challenges. Now, this is a mobile painting which most of you might have recognized from the uh, the upper okay. And it's an event from the early part of its upper's career. He had to put to death Adam Khan, who was uh, becoming a thorn on his side by throwing him down from the Agra fort fragments. And you can see him. the first time he was thrown down, he did die. So he was picked up, taken back again, and thrown down. But I'm not going to talk about <coughs> either Akbar or this act of his, so why it was significant, etc., etc. But what I want to draw your attention to painting was about telling so many things to you. It was about a kind of narration. It was about, and narration always is not disconnected. Narration is always something that brings many individual elements into a relationship. So we understand about the power structures, about uh, the various aspects of that time, etc. We can so from this painting we can go in various directions. We can perhaps even think about a critic of what Akbar was doing, probably. I mean, as the painter who painted it, he is a very significant painter in the uh, in Akbar's court, and also in a sense who had a very individual position, and which was very subtle but he often subverted the images that he was assigned to paint. So here you have, I mean, so I'm always suggesting this because you can have so many readings of this. So you have Akbar, M. Akbar, who is, I mean, at the top and ordering other kind to be thrown down. But you also have, if you look behind, a little in the distance, a man who is freeing pigeons. And so probably, so you have these two things, somebody's life being taken and then pigeons being freed in the air. So maybe you can see there are multiple narrations in a painting like this. Or you take a Rajput painting a little later, even here you get to know so, so many things about the king. This was a king who ruled, ruled for a very short period, but you get to know about him, his life, the courtly environment, about the landscape, about the nature around the court, about the season, and so on and so forth. So many things. 
So, Indian art before the colonial period was rich in this kind of narration. It was narrating about the life, about people, about the place, and all these web of narrations actually kind of cumulatively made what Indian art was. And what did the British, what did the colonial rule do? It broke down all these narrations. Because to the outsider, these narrations didn't make much sense. So they broke it into isolated units, into people of different professions, for instance. So it was like a taxonomist, you know, kind of breaking down things, finding out genre and family and things like that. So it was not the garden, it was not nature, it was not a plant growing alongside other plants. And a plant that we notice at a particular time or a particular season, but a plant which is looked at isolation and so it becomes natural history in some sense, or an animal similarly. So in a sense, what colonial rule did was they itemized the whole country. They brought everything down to independent uh, units of knowledge and dismantled narration. So what Indian artists tried to do was to find out a way of narrating once again. And one of the first artists to do this was I mean, Trevi Varma. So he took the apparatus that the Europeans were using to narrate their stories, which you call history painting, and he tried to use Indian subject matters in the mythology or literature and try to paint something that at that point of time people thought was very impressive and something that we should all try to imitate. So one attempt was to do history painting in the Western manner. So that was one of the attempts. But Abhinitranath took a different approach because he came onto the scene as a critic of artists like <coughs> Ravi Varma. So he was trained, as you all know, in the Western ways of painting. But after a while, he left that. He made a conscious decision to move away from this kind of art and try to explore a different trajectory. Now, for an artist at this point of time to go back and connect back to our history was not an easy thing to do. So he had to find various kind of ways in which he could make that happen. And that was a long kind of personal uh, kind of quest which spread from about the beginning or the end of the last decade of the, I mean, 19th century till about 1930 when he does the Arabian Night. So there's a period and there are a number of attempts that he I mean, that's before he reaches the space. <coughs> His early work were things like this, in which you can see some aspects of Victorian illustration. These were illustrations that he did for Prabhupada's play Chitrangada. And that is somewhere where he starts. He did other illustrations around the same time of the Chitrangada, Sopna Prayam, for instance. And in this, you can see that he is trying to go back to contemporary literature in a way, but his model too, in a sense, is Victorian art and Victorian illustrations. Now, Abhinendranath certainly liked Rabi Varma, but even more than Rabi Varma, <coughs> tries to connect with other arts, literature especially. He also would very soon emerge as a major literary writer alongside but very different 
from Prabhupada. So he brings something onto the Indian cultural scene, not only as a painter, but also as a writer. But before he can do all that, he has to go through all these little experiments, which are all partial successes. And we will see that he changes dramatically over the next 30, 35 years. So initially, as all illustrators do, he illustrated the literary text. So the image is subsidiary to the literary text. And he is using a style which is borrowed, which is contemporary, I mean, generally available to contemporary painters, and he's trying to use that. So that is what usually illustrators do. I mention all this because the early critics of Abhinandranath had two main uh, kind of kinds of criticism. One was he's reviving Indian art, so he's a revivalist. The second was that he is depending too much on literature and he's an illustrator. <coughs> now, all these things, in a sense, have ne negative connotations in the world of modern art, because where modern artists were supposed to move away from all other art forms, and each one was supposed to pursue something which is unique. A writer will pursue something which can be only done with words, and a painter will do something that can be done only done with forms and colors and nothing else, and sculptor will probably do something which can be done only with sculptural forms, a musician should limit himself to sound, and that should limit himself or herself to uh, movements and so on and so forth. So there was an idea of this purity of medium which is central to modern art. And you can see right from the beginning of Mitzvah was not inclined to take that path. So the what was was noticed and which made him uh, be considered as a new phase in Indian art was his series of paintings he did on the basis of Krishna Lila and the story of Krishna, which was a common thing. And you can see he's trying to draw elements from earlier traditions. When he was working under these European masters and left them, he looked around, what is the other model I can have? Then he discovers a few late Mughal miniatures, which a relative of his gifted to him. And by coincidence, he also receives a gift from an amateur European painter. She sends him a whole set of illustrations to the lyrical ballads that she had done. So he uses these two models as the the kind of plan from which he could take off, and he uses them to do things. But then, even here, there are a number of things, as we will see in the next couple of slides, which are not exactly revivalist. It is not exactly like any Indian painting before that. He has this maybe free tile composition, which he gets from the Rajput painting, the foreground, the middle ground, and the uh, distance, all arranged in tiles, one above the other, not perspective. So he probably takes this, but he uses watercolor like a Western artist, but he has a mobile painting like a border, or in this one, you can see that he's even further in stylistic terms, although it's a little miniature, most of these paintings are very small, the painted area in this case will be about three to four inches, that's all, kind of in height, and maybe about seven inches in width. So they are very small, but you can see that he's actually using the chiaroscuro, the kind of shading that Western artists would have done, and in some sense it is still close to, I mean, very uh, well, but on a very miniature scale, and. But what he's trying to do is, in a way, mimicking certain aspect of the mobile manuscript, especially in terms of the text beneath. And if you look at it, 
you can see that this is not Persian script, it is Bengali written like Persian script. And so if you look back and think about all that elements that you saw in the picture, there was a Western watercolor. It always used, I mean, European paper and Winston and Newton colors and things like that. So he didn't use any Indian material like uh, later somebody like Nandalal would do. And, but he was always deeply interested in the Mughal tradition. So he takes this way of writing text and mimics it in a sense. So you have the European elements which went into the painting. You have the Hindu mythological subject matter. And you have the Mughal Islamic tradition. All three are coming together. And which, I mean, we don't see these things coming together in this manner in earlier works. So when it came, you have all these three things coming together. In a sense, maybe we can see a certain beginning of this even in the Mughal period. But as Rabindranath would write, that his family drew upon these three cultures. The, the European culture, which various members derived through maybe literature, through art, and so on. The Islamic culture, which preceded, I mean, the colonial period, and also the Hindu traditions of India. So they are drawing on all three of them, and the Abhinitanath, like other members of his family, especially Rabindranath, is clearly drawing on all these three aspects. Now, on the top of this, this is from 1896-97, and this is the same time that E.B. Havel, who comes from Madras Art School to Calcutta to take charge of the art school, he arrives in the same year, I mean 1896, and he meets up in Islam, and he's quite impressed with the, these works because he wanted to Indianize art education. And he thought here the Zen artist could be a collaborator in that project. So he, after much persuasion, which took about almost 10 years, in 1905, Abhinath agreed and became the vice principal of the Calcutta Art School. Now, in between, there were other things happening. Around 1902, the end of 1902, Okakura Kapuso arrived in Calcutta with the idea of, I mean, finding favor for this project of pan Asianism. So, he also gets to know Abhinitanath, and like Havel, Okakura was somebody who was responsible for reviving uh, Japanese traditional painting in Japan in a context which is not colonial but where the influence of the West was overriding everything traditional in that country. So Okakura as the head of an art school tried to revive the Japanese traditions and when he went back in 1903, he sent two of his I mean, senior artists to come to Calcutta and to interact with the Indian artists in Calcutta. So they, they actually worked alongside Abhinitanath on the famous South Varanda. And when Abhinitanath saw the way they worked, which was so different, they did large paintings with very thin washers I mean, where you could hardly see any object. But then, as they finished, maybe certain elements came into prominence. So, looking at them, he developed his own technique of painting, which we call the wash technique. And you have, this is one of the early uh, works using that technique. What you see, it's of course based on Kalidasa's Megal. And then he uses this new technique for painting 
so that you don't give up on realism, but you are able to use it in a much more freer manner than the academic papers did or even the mobile papers did. So you could focus on what you want, the rest of it go to your best and so on. Now this technique is further developed when he does this series based on the Rubaiyats of Omar Khayyam. And that was done, there were two sets, the first set was done from 1907 and the later one from 1910. So during this period, you can see various other things happening. Now, you can notice that whole focus is on the two figures. And you can see the space is very subtly divided. There are spatial processions, but those spatial processions are merely suggested and not, I mean, kind of made clear through shapes of color. So it almost looked like this figure is floating against a somewhat ambivalent space, which has just mere suggestiveness that if you look closely, you'll probably notice there are these thin lines which you can see which divides, and you can see on the wall there's a little niche. So you have these suggestions of space, but on the whole, it is more like floating. And But when you look at very closely, you also notice how the detailing is done, and how the contours are being, I mean, emphasis on, but not really having a full model. Now, if one looks, I mean, this is something that we will notice in many painters of this time, and surprisingly, we'll see this in somebody like Picasso in the blue and pink period, because the emphasis on the contours, the emotional kind of uh, thing, the backgrounds being ambivalent. There are other paintings we can think about, like the blind musician, for instance, I mean, where the background is almost like another painting, and it's as if the figure is floating in some space. Now, these are all faces, and you might have also noticed oh, gradually is shifting away from storytelling. And by 1910, his whole interest in what we call a Sudeshi movement comes to an end. Because he was not a natural nationalist, like, say, Mandala. He came into it because people who were very close to him were part of that movement. Prabhendranath was one of the figurettes of the Sudeshi movement, who was like a role model for him. Hadal, who was, who we always call Guru, was another supporter of this movement. Sister Nivedita, whom he celebrated in his Bharat Mata image, was also one of the moving figures of this national movement. Now, all of them leave that space, which after 1978, Hadal left India, and he was not allowed to come back, so he went to England. He disappeared from the scene. Nevedita died after that. And from 1909, I mean, Rabindranath moved away from political association and proceeded to Shatari Kedan, where he wanted to focus more on education and other forms of constructive association. Kind of thing. So, all the people for whom Abhinandranath really entered the Sudeshi phase of his art, they moved away. And he also feels much more free after this point. And a different kind of artist begins to emerge. The narrative aspect is gone. He is interested, for the first time you can see, in the popular arts. He does this whole series based on the actors of the genre. So where you have exaggeration of characterization, you have a very visible, non-realistic element involved. So this is the, the kind of Babu as the lover going and waiting in front of this uh, 
house of the mistress who seems to be cross with him. So it's a kind of rather, I mean, I mean, kind of weak romantic hero that he's kind of. Or an actress who is playing the role of Ready on the stage. I mean, you can see that it's not the idealist figure. You can see that actually she's wearing a wristwatch, which is a new kind of thing that came into the market. So she's also, I mean, a fashionable person in a way. And also these exaggerated emotions and so on. And you can see that is somewhat like what Chris Luthier was doing. So what you notice that this person who we all think that is a revivalist was also doing things which was similar to what other modern artists were doing. And the impetus came not that he was looking at them, although his brother was a collector, Dakarendra was a collector of, I mean, uh, Western art. And so these books were there. So when European visitors who came in 1910, like, I mean, to the Jorosanko house, they have left records saying that they have all these new books. I mean, they are familiar with it. And so even if he's not talking, he has an understanding of what is taking place elsewhere. And all this comes, because if you read his text, you can see he's also thinking in similar terms. He's thinking about in aesthetics in a way which is similar to Montclair. I mean, thinking that imagination is more important, that is the thing, and sensibility is at the center of what an artist does. Now, these are things that fed into modern artists, like early Picasso, and uh, even some scholars have tried to see elements of that going as far as cubism, that attitude to art. So, they were familiar, and he uses similar metaphors, like when he writes. Sometimes when he quotes somebody, it's actually Bothler quoted second hand by someone else. So if you look at his later writings, you can see this. So his first set of writings that he did were within the framework of the Swadeshi. But actually even his writings and his essays on art moves away from that around this period. So he's no more an artist who is actually unaware of the West or unaware of what other modernists are trying to do. He may not be imitating them, but within the Indian context, he's trying to create something similar. You can see in paintings like this, there's no narration at all. So these are meant to evoke a certain mood a certain I mean, effect a scene has had on the artist, just like modern European poets and artists were trying to do. So you see things like that from about 19, maybe it was painted even a few bit earlier, 1914 maybe. So you have images of this kind. So the narration goes away in a sense. But it comes in other ways, and we do not know the exact date of this painting, but uh, probably around 1920. And you can see, I mean, it is a continuation in some sense of the Jatra actors, <coughs> that it is based on a text by Shandara Jatya, I mean, a philosophical text. But it is actually making fun of the religious figure. You can see this Pandit is like a person in a well, in a dark well, bending all his, I mean, scriptures, and you can see above that, like a little sky, where you have a bird which belongs to that sky. So in a sense, this is not an illustration so if you look at all of the things that we saw, up to maybe the Krishna Lila series, maybe even to his Mughal series, we can say he's illustrating in the literature of history. 
But by the time we came to the robots of our poem, he is not illustrating in the normal sense that he is not secondary to the writer. He is trying to translate it into visual images, what he sees in the text. And by the time he is here, he is actually critiquing the text. He is subverting the text. So he is using image not to tell you about what the text is doing, but sometimes to critique the text. So you see that he's moving away and he's growing in different directions. Then in the early 20s, he does a series of things where you can see that he's trying to bring back narration in some sense. So once there was a point where he started the narration, gave it up, then he's trying to bring it back. Wasn't this Sena, this character from Rishya Pratika, the uh, ancient Sanskrit play. So it's not illustrating, but he's picking on these characters, this strange character which was a, who was a courtesan, but also a courtesan with a mind of her own, a very, I mean, if you look, an independent thinking woman in of those early times. And so this it's a character that moves between the sensuality of the body and the originality of the mind in some way. And awkwardly posed in this in-between space. <coughs> On other figures, like this painting which he calls the woman with the golden necklace. Now, he's again looking at tropes that artists have used elsewhere. They had a large collection of Japanese art and things like that. So you have this figure which is almost silhouette but it's moving around the axis. And which is something that not only he was looking at, the European masters were also looking at the same thing at the same time and doing similar things. Maybe an oil, large kind of thing. This is a portrait. And Ed Clint uses the same Japanese model in some sense. So the similarity between our names now that maybe Western modern art that we notice, if you look carefully, is not coming directly from the West, but it is because the modern Western artist whom we looked at and Abhinandana, they are both looking at the Japanese models of an earlier period. So because they are both looking at that, including Tullus Lutheran, so that is from where both of them are taking elements and therefore they come close, although they might not be looking at each other directly. Now, similarly, from the same period you have Sevenesa. This is the daughter of Emperor Aurangasi and uh, she was a poetess. And she was a poetess of romantic poetry. <coughs> And you can see in each one of these, the style is changing. The style is related to the character. The style is no more something that the artist has. In the beginning, we saw that Abhinitana was just borrowing a style. But now he is not borrowing. He is actually inventing a style for each of these figures. Because each character tells you something. And the style has to make that character come alive. So, in the 20s, when he does this, or here you have three historical characters who are very important to the history of that period, Rabindana, Gandhi, and C.F. Andrews. And probably this was done, there was this famous closed-door meeting between these three in Jorosanko. I mean, nobody knows exactly what they said, except for a little inkling that, I mean, uh, C.F. Andrews leaves I mean, it is not much later. So you can see this. I mean, they are almost like uh, three, I mean, Buddhist arhats in the Japanese thing. This is probably not a detail closer. So he's using these different kind of ways of painting in relation to the characters that he's trying to present and tell us something, the style. It becomes in itself a narration. And 
I'll show you a couple of images because this would be of great interest to all of you. This is based on his visit to Sajapur. And uh, so he did this series of landscape. He didn't do many landscapes. He did those because I think the place he lived in Calcutta didn't have these kind of landscapes. So he did them when he traveled. And the best examples of landscapes that he did was when he came to this part of Bengal. And, and the year he traveled, I mean, he was not um, a very easy, I mean, frequent traveler. He had to be prodded. And you can see in the early letters, Rabindranath is continuously prodding him to get out of the South Varanda and travel to Japan, travel to uh, Shilaida. <coughs> He's saying, come, I am waiting for you, etc., etc. And you have to get out of the South Varanda. And then once you get out, you'll be free. And so on and so forth. But Avrindranath and Gagarindranath both don't respond. But later at some point in the 20s, maybe mid-twenties, he does visit. And probably he visited more than once, but not very frequently. Because there's a letter that he wrote to his daughter, which is undated. He says, Ebar Ku Kona. So there was a flood, and so that Ebar mentions, we can think that also he went some of the time before. And he does a series of paintings. So the local market, the and these are also very small, meaning maybe just the size of my laptop. That's the kind of uh, size of these paintings. But when you look at them very closely, you can see such amount of detail. Look at the market and look at the talgats there with a kite, broken kite hanging on it. So you can really see that he puts in a lot of thing, observation into his painting. So it's not the wishy-washy kind of thing that we normally associate with the Bengal school at all. Or here, he is making an image of their own Kacheri office. And you have the, the kind of landing built of bamboos. And when you look very closely, you see actually the figure standing on it is Robinson. I mean, not something that he did from life, but something he, when he visits, he probably imagines Rabindranath standing on that. And once again, look at the kind of detailing he builds into it. And another painting I'm showing you, three of these, is this, the tomb of Maktoum Shah, or Sahib, as he writes. I mean, which is done Again, during this time, he's visiting, and the tomb is still there, but I think now it's remodeled. There are other structures nearby, and kind of. So he was somebody who is reliving history in various ways, but reliving history in relation to real experiences. Or this magnificent figure, I mean, the two people who comes visiting the tomb. I mean, he, in fact, wears a dress like many of the uh, Tago uh, men wore. And it's such a kind of moving picture with this great stability of the central figure. And the little animation, I mean, of the horse and the fowl, which is just a little kind of thing that breaks away from that almost static image of him. And so, like him, a visitor who visits this place, and probably going back into the Middle Ages where events, these events took place, so he's going back on a visit to Sajapur. Then again, around 29, this again, we see we have a firm dating that he does a whole series based on theater, on Ravindran's theater, and he paints various people who were around that Dinendranath, for instance, playing the role of Brahmati. And some of the others, Alakendranath, I mean, again, playing the role of Kumarasena. They are almost like puppets in a sense, or like masks. So he has these 
various figures and there's a whole series of that in this book. What it does is that he's coming back <coughs> to narration in various ways. He's interested in characters and he's interested in bringing them back in that particular context of the contemporary life. And then in 1930, he does this fabulous sets of 45 paintings. I mean, I think that is a real great achievement. I mean, if you will look at a few of them and to imagine a man sitting down and painting 45 such pictures in one year, it's the Arabian Nights. And if you, when we go through this, you will also notice the technical mastery that he has. I mean, you can compare him with the finest artist in world history. And the complexity of the themes that he's dealing with. And the intellectual subtlety that he brings into it. In fact, these paintings were little noticed when he painted them. Everybody talked about the Bharat Mada, but never really discussed, talked about the Arabian Nights. Simply because I think the intellectual complexity of these pictures were too much to be, I mean, noticed and understood at that point of time. In fact, before I researched on this, hardly anybody talked of it, except that Vinod Bihari said they were great paintings. Also, Subramanian wrote a small essay of two or three pages, very, I mean, places great stress on this. Otherwise, if you look through all the previous writers, they don't even notice it. They were little exhibited, except occasionally in the 40s while he was in Shantanikhet. So, we'll notice as we go along that it's probably its highest achievement of any artist of that time or at any time. Anyway. Now, to get all these three things together, that technical mastery, complexity of themes, and intellectual subtlety together I mean, in a painting. That is even more rare. Now, he himself has written that his entire experience as a man and an artist is there in these pictures. So we'll turn to these few paintings that we'll notice. And so this is one of the framing stories of their Nights. Most of you should be familiar with the basic story that it is centers around this king who finds that his wife was not very honest with him and to take revenge he decides to marry a virgin every day and the next morning he would cut off her throat and I mean decapitate so this is what happens. And then Shashtada, who is the narrator of the Arabian Nights, this female narrator, who is the daughter of his Basi, she says, well, I will marry him. And let me see. And then she begins to narrate the story. And the king is so enraptured by the story that he doesn't hear her. The story doesn't end by morning. So he says, okay, we'll hear the rest of the story and then maybe kill you. So this goes on for a thousand and one nights. By the end of it, of course, he is a wiser person and they have a family and the king decides not to kill him. Okay, now this part of the thing, most of you might know, but then think about it in the colonial context. That it is the inferior person. I mean, the colonial rulers were, normally they compared the Indian and the Indian males to women. So, Arnitanath is identifying himself with this female narrator. That is the subversive part. And we will see that how he takes, and she is the one who eventually traps the weaker person in the end. So I think that is something that 
was in the back of his mind when he did this. And just look at these drawings. I mean, this is a, I mean, what you're seeing on the screen is actually in a painting because again, these paintings are about 11, 12 inches in height. So this figure may be occupying, the face may be occupying a centimeter of space and a few inches, the whole figure. And you can see that how strong that drawing is. I mean, it's almost something that you can compare with the finest drawing by any Indian miniature artist, or maybe even by a European artist. And that was it. And when he goes on to kind of, and he does several things in this picture, which is not there in the stories. I already said that he was using text by the 20s, not as an illust uh, a kind of text for illustrating it. But he was painting images which were counter to the text, which is, he was painting images which kind of subverted the text. So there is no particular instance where he says that the Basir and his daughter, Sharsata, and her sister, Dunyasa, who is at the bottom, that they all sat down and narrated stories. But if one has to be such a master narrator, she has to be somebody trained in that art, somebody who is already a master of it. So he imagines it as a house where the tradition of storytelling is there. So he paints these pictures of the Wazir and his daughter sitting and narrating. And look at this. What we saw for Zerunisa's portrait, you can see almost a similar treatment of this, I mean, female figure, the young lady, and opposed to that, her father, the old was it. Now, once again, you can see two characters facing each other, but done in different stylistic, I mean, features. And when I said style becomes a narrative element, where normally narration <coughs> doesn't take place, this is what modern artists did, like Picasso, painting these women, five women, in three different styles, which takes you to three different historical references. Now, this was a way of opposing characters within the same framework. So you don't have, in the modern kind of thing, you don't have a story to narrate, but then you use style to create a narration. And he did this throughout his life, in a sense. Two figures facing each other. One an young man, one an old person. The old person almost done in the way maybe Rembrandt does his I mean, self book I mean, an artist whom he really greatly admired. <coughs> I mean, when somebody asked Picasso, would you like to draw like someone? He said, an artist you admire? He said, if I can, I would like to draw like Rembrandt. So you find this young artist who wears almost like a sailor's costume as Picasso did, and this old man who almost reminds you of Rembrandt's portrait or drawing. So they are facing each other, like people from two different I mean, spaces, two different characters come together. Many artists notice this in a sense. Like Hockney, he calls it the marriage of styles. He did a series of painting called Marriage of Styles, where you find a man with a in modern costume sitting next to a figure which is reminiscent of the Egyptian sculpture. Actually, he visits Egypt and then he gets this idea of trying to contrast styles, the European, I mean, kind of photographic or realistic manner of painting and the Egyptian kind of thing. So he does a series of painting he calls the marriage of styles. So you can see somebody like Abhinav Thanath was actually thinking on similar terms as a modern artist. And certain things, again, this is the same people, people we saw earlier, Basir and his two daughters, but you can see they are very, very different. So he is actually doing exactly as maybe a 
film director or a, I mean, theater director might do, getting different people to play the same roles in different productions. So he's using again style in a very different manner in these things. So you will see very often the same person is represented in a different manner altogether. Now, we come to this which might be one of the final moments of the Arabian Nights. The person whom we saw, the king, I mean, this very centrally seated, aggressive person, let me try to go back a little bit. Yeah. So this man, who is painted in this same, in this manner here, who is pretty ruthless, and you can see that by the time he comes here, he has sobered, melted down. Now, he is also holding a book now. Maybe this is a thousand and one night. After all the storytelling, he has been transformed. And you can see that she is watching his face, watching that transformation of this man from this cruel brute to a much more sensitive and empathetic person, which is the craft of the storyteller, to transform your listener. So the central theme of the Arabian Nights is the power of narration itself. And where does it get these characters from? Probably from photographs like this. The last members of the Mughal, I mean, imperial family, when they were thrown out of power and they were living in Calcutta, and you have this famous photograph of some. You can see the same mood in these figures. So he is actually also capturing some of that kind of this passing of history, where a history in which he was more at home, but that moment is passing and he's aware of that. You can't bring it back with all your nostalgia for that. So it's there. And then there are many elements in the in this series of Arabian night paintings which are not there in the uh, kind of actual text. I mean, Aladdin never was a lamp seller in the Arabian Nights. I mean, you read, he gets hold of this wonderful lamp and then has a whole lot of adventure following him. But he was never a lamp seller. But this is the kind of shop he should have seen along the Chitpur Road. Even if you go now, today, I mean, you can see there are so many shops selling lamps and things like that. So probably he places it right within his environment and reimagines the story of the Arabian Nights. Not as a story of adventure, but maybe of various characters re-emerging in his own times. Or of the magic carpet. He introduces this, I mean, element of the opera glasses, which actually is a, again a metaphor which does the same thing as the magic carpet, takes you from one place to another almost magically. And you can see that many modern artists have used this, the impressionists use it on, in their paintings when you have opera theater scenes. And we have Satyad Ray using it very inventively in each other. We have bold housewife using it to participate in the life on the street. So, he imagines this instrument that we have today, which does the same <coughs> job as the magic carpet. So there are all these things of the contemporary world emerging. Other things are there, like you can see there's a tap, a dripping tap, and so on and so forth. In the thing. So his own environment comes into the Arabian Nights. So the Arabian Nights is rewrite into the environment in which he lives or those of these three sisters. I mean, it's a story that happens, I think, in Baghdad, but I mean, here they are, certainly the three sisters are, I mean, in Calcutta. They, these are three Bengali people, I mean, kind of thing. 
And he's also commenting on various other things. The story is about three sisters who have this very fancy wish of marrying. One of them wants to marry the king's court, the other is a uh, kind of waiter, and the third then they must want things. Why should I dream so low? So let me, I mean, kind of want to marry, imagine that I want to marry the king himself. So the king happens to overhear it and gets their wishes done. That's the story. But, and there are many other things that goes into jealousy and various other things. But what is interesting is there's so much there in these things. Now you can see that the uh, the bread box, the man who is selling hawking things. Now he's the baker who is going out and hawking. I mean cakes and breads and things like that. It has this kind of, I mean initials there, which you can somewhat read. The first letter is G E H. Okay, this is Great Eastern Mountain where in the beginning they used to hawk things. And there were, if you look, contemporary, I mean, uh, writings, especially farces, you can see that all of this is referred to them. And it talks about how the social structures are being changed in this. So in a sense, he's using a story from the Arabian Nights to talk about contemporary Calcutta and the changes that is taking place. Okay. Now, these are important transformations taking place. Then for instance, so he is bringing in elements which are not there in the story to narrate contemporary history of the marriage of Noral I mean, in the Arabian Nights text, it is about just two, three lines saying that this marriage took place and nothing more than that. There is a much more actually after mentioning Rolandin's marriage, they, it actually goes on to talk about a longer story regarding his son and his marriage. So Arunendra takes elements from all of this, although he calls it marriage of Rolandin, he doesn't actually use elements from that little thing, but he uses other things where you see the, the groom's party coming and they are being welcomed. I mean, probably there is a little imposter there who is this hunchback on the donkey, the friend. And there are so many other elements happening and you can see even that it's a mixture of, I mean, the Middle East and Calcutta, there you can see there are the camels behind the tent and various elements in this. There's another detail where you can see some of these things. But in the slightly lower part, there is a totally different world. Just beneath this first top half, you have this scene through this translucent thing about the under mother, the women, the children, and that kind of thing. And the bottom left, you have this figure. There's the cook and his assistant sitting there. Now, if you go back, you will notice a whole lot of people. This whole picture is this big din of the marriage, which is the top part. The sound, the music, and all the glitter that is there. And when you come to the I mean, bottom, it's almost like there is total silence. As if that world of sound and all of that thing that is happening above doesn't touch here. Suddenly, as if you move into a space of total silence. And there is nothing in the story to suggest the cook or his assistant or anything. But he does this, so he locates it back in Calcutta itself. And this is also a device that literary writers of the early 20th century were using. To bring in realism, what you probably do is to bring in maybe elements that are not directly part of the narrative. So this excess of, I mean, kind of objective details was a sign of realism. That if you are just going to look at the essential things, there may be many things are not necessary. And they are not always there in old narrations. 
But when you think about realist novel, there is full of details which may not be part of the entire story that is being directed, but that creates the context in which the story is taking place. And that gives you a sense of the realism. So he is bringing the story from the Middle Ages and from far away into contemporary culture in some sense. And similarly with the famous story of the hunchback of the fish bone, which is a film, one of the more well-known stories in uh, the Arabian Nights. And he brings that into Calcutta and in so many different ways. Of course, the story is quite simple, this hunchback, I mean, uh, and his, I mean, sorry, uh, the tailor and his wife, they, they were, I mean, according to some versions of the Arabian Nights, they were in China. And uh, on a day, they went out and they thought there should be some fun. So they see a hunchback, I mean, who was already drunk, so he, they bring him home and uh, have a feast, but then the wife puts a fish bone into his rice bowl, which gets stuck in his throat, and he passes it. And they think that he's died, and they are panicky. They take him and dump him in the neighbor's house, which is an apothecary, and that guy in turn dumps this, I mean, unconscious, Hunchback into the his neighbor's court, which is who is a kind of the the keeper of the cooks. I mean the king's I mean uh, ladder and so, and then he in terms doubts that at the door of a Christian kind of thing. There are also you can see different people of different professions, different religions coming into the picture. And finally, his court, the king decides that the guy the the Christian broker, broker should be a kind of uh, punished and hung for killing this man. Then the the kind of the king's I mean, keeper of his ladder, he says, no, I was the one who dumped, so he's in this and so free. And then, then he said, okay, then this guy be hanged. And then the apothecary comes forward and says, well, he should not be hung. And, uh, then says, so this is a strange story, okay, we will leave you free if you all tell a story. So the idea of freedom and storytelling is recurring in the Arabian Nights. So this is what happens, that is what is illustrated. But it happens in Calcutta. Now, the tailor and his wife is exactly there, I mean, looking, I mean, at, at, as if Abhinidhanath is seeing it, on, I mean, looking from his south Varadha and in a sense. And behind him, you can see this whole lit area where you find, I mean, it is the house of the tattoos. There's this board says Kurt Tagore and Co., which is a slightly variation on Kurt Tagore and Co., which is the, the kind of uh, company that his great grandfather, Dardana Tagore, kind of created. And the man there is Abhinitana, entertaining two slightly hunchback Europeans. And behind him is the portrait of Dharadana. I mean, which is partly covered by that panga. And then on the top, you have a union jack. Now, it is referring to a lot about the history of the tattoos themselves. I mean, there are. I mean, doggerels from the 19th century and press reports from the late 19th century talking about the richness of Dharagana and the parties he threw. He had a separate building where he used to hold the parties because his wife wouldn't allow that to happen. And on the top of that, there was a Union Jack fly. And all the rich and eminent people of Calcutta used to be called, and sometimes in he also hosted parties outside India. And in one of the European newspapers, it is compared to an Arabian Nights event kind of thing. So his parties were very famous. So he is also bringing family history, 
and he is taking the place of Garanatha there. And this whole story is going around. So what is happening here in a sense, that this kind of an insight is a thing that painters often did, especially during the Baroque period in Europe, that you have this Velasquez picture of Christ in the home of Martha and Mary, actually that is the inset. What is happening in the foreground is that a maid is being kind of admonished by the elderly lady. And maybe referring to the story of Martha and Mary. So if these insects are used to bring a narrative into a picture which may not be narrated. So Amarindranath is using a similar element of bringing in a bit of the tiger house into the picture in a similar manner. Now, this kind of narration, he takes a model from somewhere. This model is there in ancient Indian miniatures. This is a miniature drawing that he owned. They, he, they collected quite a lot of these miniatures and they had over 400 to 500 pictures. And this is one of those pictures that you own, a Pahari Ramayana, where you can actually notice certain things. There is the uh, elderly bearded man in the foreground, before whom, I mean, Ram and Sita are, I mean, bending down. He is their family priest, Vashishta coming. Then you can see above that they are sitting on the left top corner. You can see they are having a conversation. <coughs> then there are Yetnjas and then after that he is kind of the, the king, I mean Rama, is donating a lot of cows to the Brahmins, so you can see that happening. And then even you can see as part of the rituals, they are the king and his wife, they are sleeping on straw, which you can see towards the, I mean, top, I mean, right middle. And then at the end, you can see that Vashista is leaving the palace on a chariot. So you can see a whole story is narrated within the framework. So this is the kind of thing that he uses here, in a way. So he has a model, but he's also bringing, so you can see the complexity of things. That it's not just simply <coughs> illustrating the Arabian Nights. It's, translocating into Calcutta, and various changes are taking place. So that is one thing, and similarly, if you remember his description of what he saw as a child in the Apankata, I mean, which was written about uh, three years, I think, before the Arabian Nights were painted. He has this description, because he is, as a young child, like most of the Tagore <coughs> children, they were all shut in these rooms and looked after by servants. So they couldn't go out. And even Ramitra talks about it. So what Ramitra says is that he used to lift the Venetian blinds and look out. And he sees various bits of details through these blinds. So here, for instance, he writes, I mean, just translating a little bit of that men, hen, ducks. Coach, horses, coachmen, I mean, Chira, Chiru the scavenger, Nandu the housekeeper, Govinda the lady, mm -hmm. the old sweeper, the Vishti, the porter, the Oriya bearer, the rent collector, the clerk, the gatekeeper, the main runner, they put a grand chatra in the northern port. <coughs> From morning till the hour of sleep, how many engaging events I saw happening on that side. Some on the brick dust road, some at the roundabout, some within or outside the houses of the milkmen, or on the roof of some house beyond. It was like an animated folk theatre. Not a grand tragedy or comedy, but a few moments, a few gestures, a picture or two. It could be said, I was watching a farce, packed with these. So you can see that there are these elements which he saw as a child from the window of his house and in bits and pieces because his, the whole window is not open, he's seeing through the, I mean, the openings of the 
I mean, variation blinds. <coughs> and then you put that together into a whole picture. So he's using something similar in this thing. And also it is similar in the way that old Pahari Ramayana is composed. And there is a total kind of contrast he brings in that there's a detail of the tailor and his wife. They, she is trying to revive him. And what happens? The Jew apothecary becomes a Muslim. The, the keeper of the king's larders and storehouse becomes a Marwari with a little Gandhi Tupi on his head. And he is actually worried about, I mean, cats and dogs stealing from his treasure. He is stealing from the king, but he doesn't want the cats to steal that. So he's worried and looking at that. So the Jew, the Muslim, and the Christian here becomes the, I mean, the Jew becomes a Muslim, the the, the Muslim becomes the Marwadi in the story, and of course the the money changer, the the Christian money changer becomes is guest of I mean, I mean, And they are also hunchbacks. So in a sense, it is a story about what happened, how the hunchback transformed the life and fortune of his guest. They, he took them through the kind of, I mean, edge of death and total destruction. And this is exactly what the colonial rulers did in the hunchback really takes over the destiny of the the tattoos and that of Indians. I mean, they change. They have liberated servants. They have all the paraphernalia of European culture, and they seem to be keen on kind of pleasing them. So that is to that extent that. They have the Union Jack on the roof. And there are other elements which gets the little picture of the, uh, the ship, which is a reference in a way to the, uh, the kind of the steamer business that uh, Dwaragana uh, kind of started, which actually I mean, was a failure then, and so on and so forth. So, there's also this family history and also what colonial rule did you do. So it's about, I mean, Avalinkanath is often thought of an artist who didn't touch on the political. But you can see that he's actually touching on the political and the personal these things. Now, end with this picture. Maybe I will linger on it for a few minutes. That the picture of Simba the Savior. And we know what happens in the Arabian Nights, the Simba has these seven I mean, uh, voyages, and in each voyage he has a lot of adventures, and then he comes back. I mean, at the end of his life, he is sitting back at home and narrating his story to the people in this Mohalla or locality. And that is how everybody else looked at the Simba, but not Avalanche. Okay. We'll come to this picture again and again, but just to show you how others looked at this. It was a very popular text in the 19th century onwards. Everybody was not, it was not only translated, but also illustrated. So you can see Sinbad being tied to the leg of this giant bird and moving, or maybe mating with some uh, equally dangerous giants, or being tossed by big waves. So, it is always adventure, okay? I mean, that is trust. Or even the films that man gets made, I mean, in the 40s. He is a kind of, he is a predecessor maybe to James Bond kind of thing. Handsome man, I mean, who is on an adventure doing things with, I mean, um, not only a sailor, but also a man who attracts a lot of women to him, and it's almost that kind of thing that they did. 
And this is how even the cartoon series, or even the Japanese manga, or even, I mean, uh, what you might think about the cartoons in Japanese <coughs> re-narrated like Popeye. I mean, this is the thing, and this is what catches the imagination, even of children, I mean, playing Sinbad. Right? Now, Amritana Sinbad is just the opposite. He is like Amritana. He has not traveled. Amritana is this reluctant traveler who doesn't want to get out of the South America. What he has behind him is a picture of a ship. And you can see this picture is so unrealistic. You can't say it off the ship. Elements of it are disproportionate. But it's a picture. He is seated in front of it, and he is an audience which is so varied, which is just the opposite of what the real, I mean, Sinbad does. He has the adventures, comes back, and he tells these stories of his adventures to the people in this locality. So, but Abhinitana doesn't look at the adventure part, but he's more interested in the tradition of storytelling. This is a 19th century or early 20th century picture of a narrator in a religious place, perhaps uh, somewhere like I mean, Benares, or in the deserts in the Middle East, where you have a much more simpler, frugal narrator. And which is a whole tradition. You can see that it still goes on. And people have these pictures, and sometimes, as in this case, it might be a religious picture and talking of the adventures of religious figures. So it's a very, <coughs> I mean, live tradition even now in certain parts. Of course, in our part, we have something similar that a, a man traveling with pictures and narrating things. And I mean, so now when you see this early photograph, it looks like he is sitting there like a cutter. And he, of course, was a famous narrator. So that tradition is what he's in touching on. He doesn't think about Sinbad as an adventurer, but Sinbad as a narrator, which is not the popular perception. And he uses certain, you might say, there was a whole series of models for the painting itself, like, which is supposed to be one of the early Mughal paintings of the princess of the house of Timur. It is existing only in fragments, so I'm just showing you detail where you have I mean, Timur at the center and his uh, descendants on the side. And you have similar things. Babu kind of, uh, I mean, sitting in his court with his courtiers seated around. Or that of Akbar proceeding over his religious discussions in the Agra kind of thing. And, and I mean, and this was a popular idea. I mean, you have the uh, the king, the ruler, and all his descendants on two sides. Abhinitana himself had a series of these drawings. This again is from his collection. So you can see the Mughal royal family with Timur at the center and all the descendants on two sides. And here are various versions of this. They were probably they were doing this to using as tracings for the pictures. So you have various things, you can identify some of them by the headdress, by the even by the look. Now, many elements that we see in the picture comes from these kind of things. Or this of a detail I have shown you of Shah Jahan with Dara I mean, where you have an elderly man and a little child. Or this again, something he certainly would not have seen. The I uh, mean, the Nawab of Jajjar sitting with his officers, but he has his two eggs sons on either side. So, and of course, both in the Arabian Nights, the entire storytelling happens in that. And that is also an, another element that you notice, that this picture is also happening at night. He's telling the stories, he never traveled, but he has a set of books in front of him, so he's a learned man, he's somebody who has read things. I mean, he, his adventure is intellectual rather than physical. And 
this intellectual adventure is as important, as significant as that of physical adventures of Sigma. And he has an audience who has gathered from different parts of the world to listen to him. And there is also a little thing I want to bring it into your notice that at the top of some of these paintings, this certain thing has this little description. And here again, he's using, I mean, it's gone, gone behind, beyond, I mean, uh, the Bengali written in, I mean, Persian style kind of calligraphy kind of thing. But actually, he's using a high language. He's actually, it is probably, he was a collector of the popular kind of, <coughs> I mean, uh, press. He was a collector of all kinds of, I mean, popular literature, which was often written for the little old men and so on. Somebody would be narrating, reading it to them. And it's the mixture of languages. There's Bengali, there's a bit, little bit of, I mean, uh, Persian, a little bit of Hindustani, everything all mixed together. So he's actually writing it in the same way. And the text roughly translates as, it is after much difficulty and suffering that I've gathered this wealth and I mean which is now narrating and only thing that God was kind to me. Kind. So this is what is written there and then you see this. So what you look at that little text and the image, they give you a kind of as if you are encountering two different registers of a culture. I mean, one, it is painted like maybe the finest Mughal painting is painted. I mean, only a man with great talent can do that. But the text which is written, it is in a hybrid language which suggests an half-literate person. So the painting suggests a style which is of the highest order of cultural achievement. The text which is written, the written text, suggests something which is of a more popular nature. And this is also characteristic of the Arabian Nights. The Arabs never thought about it as a classical text. But it is the colonialists who discovered it and read it, they thought it's an important Arab text. So you have these different registers, and Amrita was always a person who was aware of this. If you read his writings, you can sometimes see that you are moving from one kind of culture registered to another. I mean, you have somebody who is speaking in broken kind of sentences, then the same thing is delivered by somebody else in a kind of Babu language. Somebody else might be in literary press language and things like that. You have some of those things in his own writing. So he's aware of that cultural expression takes place at different registers. And he's also bringing that awareness into the thing. So it's not only that the Arabian Nights, I mean, a text which was itself an eclectic text, which started maybe with stories in India traveled to the Middle East, then got mixed with local traditions, also with European traditions. And then in the end, it is rediscovered and translated by the English and the French and becomes a kind of world classic. So he is aware of this and brings it into his thing. So at the center you have the storyteller who never traveled, who <coughs> belongs to the place, but he's also a combination of the two, the old and the young. There is no young child in the Arabian Nights who tells these stories. Only thing is that the Sinbad, the sailor, I mean, here's a porter sitting outside his gate, who is also called Simpa. And he is complaining that in this hot afternoon, I'm carrying this load and kind of thing, and I can hear music and big party going on inside. And there are people who have been favored by God, and guys like me who have to suffer. So, Sinbad the sailor sends a little child and asks him to come in. So these two Sinbads, the Sinbad the sailor and the boat, one who is rich now and one is poor, 
thing. And in fact, Simba tells similar sentences to the quote of saying, I acquired all this after great strength. So maybe that was there, but otherwise there's no fact. But if you look at Anitna's writing, you notice something else. You read all his writings, especially like Appan Kodha. I mean, it's an elderly person who is narrating the story, but it is seen from a child's perspective. Or if you read something like Mashi, which was written just before the Arabian Nights, you don't know what's the age of the narrator. Sometimes you think, it is Abu who is a very old person now. And, and sometimes you think it is Abu who is a little child. So this indefiniteness of age of the narrator is something that you find in all of in past texts. And so he also, when he does it, Bhavi should be lectures, he says that an artist has to have something of a child in him. So you have these two people together and the little gandhi on which they are sitting is his science, Abhinitra. So it is both of them together who becomes the narrator and the artist. And as I said earlier, you have his listeners are from different parts of the world. There's the Chinese, there is the <coughs> the man who cannot sit on the floor. I mean, the Chinese I mean, uh, who has this long tail which touches the earth. So there's also a sense of humor. And the other parts of Asia, different colors, different regions, different races, all coming to listen to the story of the master narrator. So Abhinitana transforms, I mean, Simba from being this adventurer to become, to be a master narrator. And that was his whole thing. What colonialism did was take away the voice of the native. The native's ability to tell his own stories. That power was taken away by the colonizer. Now what Abhinitra does is to regain the power to narrate your own stories. Regain the stories from your perspective as you see it. And it is also about modern art or modern artists. Today, you have a situation where a master artist sits in a place, works in a place, maybe he doesn't move out like our name, but the whole world is his audience. So it is about this historical transformation that is taking place, and he is witnessing that. And he is also countering the colonial kind of, I mean, negation of the native's power to narrate his own story. So that was the double purpose of the Arabian Nights. And uh, they can go more into details and into other paintings to establish such a reading. But I think this would be enough. And uh, I would be kind of I mean, happy if you to ask me something, but I think I've taken a long bit of time, tested your patience, and uh, so thank you very much for uh, kind of uh, bearing with me and sitting and listening patiently. So thank you. Very much.